and there we are. So we are recording, and we are now <clears throat> recording our Bible study, and I'm going to show you this uh, PowerPoint presentation that I have begun developing and will maybe finished someday in the near future. Um, I'm thinking probably somewhere after 2050 or something like that. But at the rate I'm going, it'll never happen in this life. So uh, anyway, so what we'll, we'll do here, let's go over, see if we can get it to do. If we can have a slideshow from the beginning and I don't need the presentation mode. So I'm going to add the presenter view. But uh, you can, well, supposed to. Anyway, you can see I, I started making this Genesis 3, Adam's account of his violation and its inescapable effects. And that should not be right there in that little block. That should not be a small I. That should be a capital I. Um, there. Now, so you can see what I did here. I'm just trying to give a quick overview. Adam explains the origin of death, suffering, and destruction, destruction in the creation. This is his explanation of how death, suffering, and destruction came to exist in a perfect creation. He, the head, had usurped to himself authority not delegated to him by the creator. So this is like Adam's admission. You you know, people are always talking about this idea. Well, what, did Adam and Eve, did, did they repent? And did, did they believe? Did they change? You know, what did they do? Well, if you understand the nature of the scriptures, and if you realize, as we've talked about, you know, uh, Rebecca, what gets me is we have seen so many times that there is so much evolutionary perspective in the linguistics field that it has affected people's belief in the scriptures and the origin. And it's just like that basic idea that nothing was written by the godly until Moses wrote under the influence of the Holy Spirit in the late, shall we say, latter part of the 15th century BC. So the 15th century. So now, 2,700 years after creation, this is the first time, and consider the Holy Spirit of God who was there working, working in the original creation has been inactive and has done nothing with language, with, his, with the godly, for 2,700 years. You know, I used to be that stupid. I used to be that dumb, but I am not that dumb anymore. I don't think the Holy Spirit of God was off on vacation somewhere for 2,700 years. He was actively working, and he would have been actively involved in the uh, imparting of the language to Adam and Eve that they knew they knew immediately after having been created because God spoke to them in that language. And that's another matter we could deal with there, uh, which I'm, I'm working on in another situation because we have people saying, well, you know, Paul said he spoke with the tongues of men and of angels. I submit to you, Paul did not say that he spoke in the tongues of men and of angels. Paul was saying there in that text in 1 Corinthians 13 that, that if ever he spoke in the languages of humans, or shall we say, if ever in the languages of humans he spoke, even languages of angels. But the issue is this, the angels and God spoke to people in the languages they already knew. And God spoke in the language he had built into his human creations, his angels. His angels are not going to speak to them in some other language. The angels are going to speak to them in the exact same language. It would make absolutely no sense for God to come to man and say, That's, That is pure ignorance. 
or an angel to come and speak in a language that the humans could not understand. In other words, I submit to you, Paul knew that there was no gift, there, there was no real gift of speaking in the languages of angels because the languages of angels were the language of God and they were the languages God had built into people to cause the distribution upon the face of the earth that occurred at Babel. Those, they would know and they would be able to learn languages. But the language, did the language of God change? Did the language that he used in his very first humans, the language that would have been the absolutely perfect representation of himself? Did he build in something that was secondary in quality? Absolutely not. But you see, we think, well, you know, that, you know well, the, you know, the Egyptians had their hieroglyphs, and, and then you look at those hieroglyphs, and so many things are out there, and people, people who are ignorant and unlearned are watching this stuff on the internet and on television, and they are believing the lies that men are presenting to them before they will they will search and study and believe what the scriptures are saying themselves it's incredible how ignorant and how i mean the stupidity the the foolishness of it is incredible but that's what we do been there done that don't want to ever go there again so this would be Adam's expression of the origin of these. This is like Adam's confession. When you realize the first four chapters were written by Adam, then you begin to see chapter three. This is his confession of his failure. And he puts it into writing for all time. So did Adam, did Adam and Eve confess their sin and forsake it? Don't have a doubt in my mind. Don't have a doubt. And uh, there'd be another thing. If Adam wrote the first four chapters, and if the, if the scriptures were written by holy men of God, as they were born along by the Spirit of God, then that means Adam would have been one of those holy men of God. Indeed, he would have been the first. And you say, you can't prove all of this. You can't, you can't show me book, chapter, verse. And I would say to you, uh, if you are that lacking in perception, then you need to learn something about, about the person and nature of God and his relationship to the creation before you ask the question. Because I'm not going to waste my time teaching someone or trying to teach someone who rejects basic understanding of the person and nature of God. If you want to know it, I teach it, but if you're going to reject it, I don't have time for you. Plain and simple. And I'm and it's just like, you know, listen, you got to realize the when Paul was on Areopagus, he did not go after those who went away and said, Oh, well, we'll hear you about this some other time. He didn't go after them and said, No, 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 come listen to me. I got to tell you if this is the truth. He didn't go after. He taught those who remained and who wanted to hear and wanted to learn. Christ taught those who wanted to hear and wanted to learn. And those who rejected, he allowed them to reject. Because the only thing that changes a rejector is when the rejector finds that his design that he has is not going to work. And then he turns back to the design of the creator. So anyway, so, he, the head, Adam, the head, had usurped to himself authority not delegated to him by the creator. The creator, in perfect expression of his person, and I use this changed, and I should have quotes on there in this, as I did before, changed from Brother the Sheets, person, uh, I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, your recording stopped. It looked like it. Did it? I got a message that your recording stopped at the bottom anyway. I just want to make sure if it's still going or not uh it's looking like it's still going on my end yeah it's still going oh is it 
Okay, never mind. Okay, if it's thank going, you. okay, thank you for, for being <laughs> observant. I try. Uh, so, uh, so we have, he changed from the perfect conditions of his original creation at exist, as it existed before violation to the perfect but undesirable from the human perspective conditions, if you will, those conditions of his creation as it currently exists. And then from there, Adam, we go, go to the next. And we, then we have the serpent identified, the great dragon, that old serpent, the one being called and who exists, the devil and Satan. And we had that. And there's the Revelation 12, 9 and Revelation 20, verse 2, which identify the serpent. And then I, put, I had put in here another uh, slide. This is a, this is a, um, a copy of the temptation seal that was found in Tepegara. And I think Tepegara is somewhere near, uh, if I recall, I think it's not too far from Mosul in Iraq. And uh, it's in that same general area of Northern Iraq. Hmm. And it's supposedly one of the oldest human settlements of all time. Uh, numbers vary depending on the individuals and depending on how, and on how much the individuals who are assessing the date hate God. The ones who hate God more tend to make it go back to uh, the 3000s, maybe 3500, 3800 BC. And, uh, you know, it goes back to the time before the flood, if you will, in Tepigara. But then you have others that bring it down as far as to about 2900, maybe even 2800s BC. And that it's still pre-flood, but these people insist that it must be, it must be pre-flood. Could it be? Certainly it could be. Was it pre-flood? I don't know. But the interesting thing is, is the depiction here. And if you look this up, and I got to tell you, the interpretation of this, the formal interpretations that are in the uh, the printed and the the literature that is now being placed on the internet, these interpretations are changing. And the reason they're changing is because it is too obvious what this temptation seal, which is somewhere around 2,500 to four th uh, to 3,000 years old, according to these people, uh, I said, said 4,500 to 5,000, let's say, years old, and and you can see this this is depicting here is here is the let's say over here here's the man and you see the horns on the head depicting him as the the leader the authority there's a tree in between them and it was a clay seal to to mark in clay and the you have the tree between them and you have at the bottom you have fruit hanging from the tree and one is seated on one side I doubt that they were seated, but that's that's just a, a later representation. This is what humans do with the with the truth. They they twist it to fit their concepts, and then on the other side, you have you have the woman seated, and she has her hand stretched forth to take the fruit. And you say, well, the man's hand is stretched forth too. Keep in mind when the woman took the fruit. And the scripture says, then she gave to her husband with her. That means the husband must have extended his hand to some degree to receive that fruit. So it is not, uh, there's nothing wrong with this if you know what the scriptures actually say. But you look behind the woman and as if standing on its tail is a serpent. It's obviously a serpent, but it's as though it's able to stand on its tail and its head is right up behind her head as if, as if talking to her in some way. And you say, well, that doesn't look like a woman to me and that doesn't look like a man to me. Well, you go, go make up your own stories then, quite honestly. Don't waste my time. But this is and nowadays it's being changed to say well it's just kind of a some kind of a, 
a representation of an agrarian society and all of this stuff. And it's, it's amazing how they have eliminated what is so clearly related to what happened in Genesis 3. But be that as it may, this is what the world is doing. So, and by the way, you should be able to find this. Uh, now, let me tell you where I, well, my, uh, price. I think of Monuments of the Ancient Near East, uh, a book by Price. Hold just a second. I didn't look this, look at it. Okay, I have the book here somewhere. Uh, I do not see it immediately, so we'll not worry about it right now. But um, I did have, I have two editions of the book. It's a book about archaeology. And um, the, the first edition uh, by Price did not have a picture of the temptation seal, which had been found. The second edition text did have the picture. And I loaned that book to someone who was going to teach archaeology uh, at the college and seminary. And uh, he has misplaced it. And now, I guess, Rebecca, it belongs to him. And I'm not talking about your dad either. I'm talking about another, uh, another of our, shall we say, older professors. You know how people are when they get old. They can't remember what they borrowed or what they did with it if they did borrow it. So, mm. what? Yeah, yeah. My wife's looking it up on uh, Wikipedia. Adam and Eve cylinder seal, and they say, uh, "Oh, now, now they've changed the timing of it too. Mm -hmm. it, it's a post Akkadian, so now it's after the Akkadian era, dating from about twenty two hundred to twenty one hundred bc okay. so describes it but uh what did it say the seal depicts two seated figures a tree and a serpent and was formerly believed formerly mm -hmm. believed to evince some connection with adam and eve from the book of genesis mm -hmm. it is now seen as a conventional example of an acadian banquet scene mm -hmm. so an acadian <laughs> banquet scene with a serpent standing at the back of someone's head and a tree between two individuals. Mm -hmm. and of you know, course, they don't tell you what changed their mind, right? <laughs> modern, modern scholarship is getting, you know, Stephen, they're getting just about as dumb as they can be. I'm surprised they didn't call it a Christmas tree. Uh, I, you know, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. See, Maybe, you see the ornaments? Yeah, and the ornaments on the Christmas tree. Wow. So what is the snake doing then? Oh, it was probably found in the tree. You know, oh well. What a what an era we live in. What an era. So, all right. So anyway, go down to the next slide. So the temptation was effective. But notice what it was. Restating what God said, not to confirm but to turn it into a question. And this is, this is also why nowadays, when I have someone who wants to challenge me about a teaching, I basically just say, no, X, don't have time, not going to waste time with a challenger. The issue is because, see, challengers are saying, well, whatever you said the text is saying, that's not what it's saying. I believe it says this and not that. Well, you may be right, but if you issue it as a challenge, it is a demonstration that you are in a, your, your attitude is one where you are not willing to learn what is necessary to interpret it correctly. And it doesn't mean that I have interpreted co correctly. It just means that you, you're saying, I am not willing to, to learn to be able to interpret it correctly if I am wrong. And that is, that's the antithesis of the design of God. And you can see you've got the word subtle down there and the yay where he's asking the question, raising the issue. Did God really say that? Hmm. And the answer is obviously no, God didn't say that. What he actually said was no. So now let's go on. So, 
as we're down here now and we go down to here we go we've gone through this now the temptation what was what satan was actually offering he was offering what people are living today we have we have a fully you know what rebecca you mentioned shalom we live in the shalom of this this mentality you yourself can be like god you could be like god don't you want to be like god don't you want to be able to determine good and evil for yourself and if you want to if you want to acknowledge god yes go right ahead and acknowledge him and if you don't want to acknowledge him then go right ahead and don't acknowledge him because see you're like god you can acknowledge him or not acknowledge, and you're none the worse for wear. So understanding grammar and sentence structure are essential for full understanding of any text, no less the word of God. Satan used a comparative clause to entice the humans, and your eyes will exist open, and you will exist, understood, knowing good and evil as God exists, knowing good and evil. He is that, and he doesn't learn it from an external source. He isn't taught it. He does not refer to an external so source. He is the determinant, the determiner, the definer, if you will. So Adam and Eve knew only one God, and that God did not know good and evil as though a standard existed external to him. He was the determiner, the very definer of good and evil. This was Satan's offer you will be like God, able to determine good and evil for yourself. This ability, however, had always existed, but it had existed unaffected by a propensity to violate. After the violation, after the change occurred to where they now knew experientially what it was like to have violated the perfect design of the perfect creator, they would have a propensity to continue to violate. And we talked about that as well previously. So as we go on down, so the temptation, you have authority, use it. You do not need God, you can decide your own course. God designed humans to exercise authority within his constraints. Remember what we saw about that, the free will? You have a free will, within the criteria of the design of God. There's a, a total and perfect freedom within the boundaries which God has established. And, and this is why what people who reject God never understand because they think, I can't, if you get put any boundaries on me, then I'm not free. If you don't put boundaries on, they're gonna be destroyed because you cannot escape the design of the creator. That sense of authority and its inherent correlation to acting independently was not bad or undesirable in any way. It was a reflection of the being of God, an aspect of his nature as the head. That's what Adam was. He was the head over all that existed. Both humans partook of that nature in the image and they could have used it in perfect accord with the criteria of his design, but they would not do so. They would step beyond the bounds of the creator's own design for using the authority he had imparted to them. They were the first living souls in the image of God, and they chose to exercise their delegated authority independently of the structure and hierarchy established by God. For reasons not so well understood, even after years of history, both the first man and the first woman developed a will that was contrary to the expressed will of God, and each would do his or her own will, despite the seeming undesirability of that choice. And the temptation, the situation in which God had placed man, was one in which man seemed to have almost unlimited boundaries regarding what he was capable of doing, but his creator had not designed him to do everything he had the ability to do. The creator had built into man abilities which far exceeded what he was designed to do. 
But human activity was not to be governed by ability. It was to be governed by the will, the design of the one to whom it belonged by right of creation. Man's abilities would give him the capability to kill, to lie, to steal, to violate God's perfect design in multiple ways that were all destructive. But the Creator had not designed him to function in this manner. Man was not to do everything he could. He was to do what he was designed to do. Now, the temptation. Again, more. The woman was the first to violate God's design for human existence. The first recorded action of this sort was that of the woman. She had been created to exercise her authority under the authority of the man God had placed over her in his design for human hierarchy. But she chose to remove herself from that God-designed subordination. She exercised her own authority to enter into a conversation that from its beginning was oriented to creating doubt in the nature and authority of the Creator. She exercised her own authority to restate God's prohibition according to her own understanding. She exercised her own authority to evaluate the quality and desirability of the fruit, though the Creator had established these matters by his very statement of prohibition. She exercised her own authority to eat of the fruit, and all this she did without seeking any counsel from her husband who was with her. The woman chose to act and interact and evaluate and decide on a course of action just as though she were an independent authority unbound by any authority over her. That is, she had the ability, she now possessed the authority to determine good and evil for herself. Though she was deceived, and that's 1 Timothy 2.14, she was nonetheless in violation. That is, Eve sinned by failing to think and act in accord with the criteria of God's design for her as subordinate to Adam. The woman's violation of God's design was to usurp authority she did not possess. Eve thus usurped a level of authority which did not belong to her. Despite the fact that the serpent addressed himself directly to Eve, she should have or and could have deferred to her husband, her head. The scripture indicates that Adam was indeed present, a condition that would not have escaped the serpent's discernment and one upon which he certainly intended to capitalize. Apparently Satan, the serpent, did not think that he would be successful in approaching Adam directly. He was, however, more arum, more clever, more able to design an effective plan of action to accomplish what he desired than were the other beasts of creation. As an angelic creature using the body of the serpent, excuse me, Satan knew God's hierarchy for man and woman, and he must have recognized the implications of deceiving the only creature designed to be a helper specifically corresponding to Adam, and which both Satan and Adam understood to be under Adam's purview. The bond the cleaving relationship that God had created between the man and his wife could not have been overlooked by the serpent, and he was clever enough to use that bond to man's detriment. If he could but deceive the subordinate to act as though she were the superior, and then to express her desire for her husband to violate that which he knew was wrong in the sight of God, the man might succumb to the desire, the tushuka, as we saw, of his wife. Why the man might do so did not matter in the final analysis. The issue was to use whatever was at hand to bring the man to violate the Creator's design. Satan recognized the need for the male that had to violate God's design. Satan recognized the corruption of the only race that bore the image of God and that is not related to other human races. There are no other human races. There's only one. And that image that bore the image of God could not be accomplished by deceiving the subordinate alone, the head, the male, the first created human, the one who bore the primary responsibility under the creator would have to be corrupted. Though the first man might have successfully resisted against any direct attempt of Satan to corrupt him, 
that same man, driven by the nature of his headship over his wife and his accountability to God for fulfilling that headship, might be moved to submit to her will, even if she indicated her will to involve violating the Creator's will. This was Satan's well-crafted plan, and it worked perfect perfection. He would deceive the woman into entering a state of having violated God's design by usurping authority. And she would then extend her misappropriated authority by expressing her desire for the man to join her in her state of violation. And the man, though undeceived, was to be moved to willfully usurp an authority reserved only for the Creator. The woman was enticed through deceit, and we should be getting close to the end of this. The man's choice was purely his own. The serpent provided Eve with additional information, further insight regarding God's purpose in forbidding them to eat from that one particular tree. In so doing, he helped her reframe her thoughts about God's prohibition and thereby influenced a change in her will in the matter. This is the essence of deceit. Information is presented to the perception of a receiver in a manner intended to convince the receiver to act on that information in a way contrary to truth and right, but which accomplishes the design of the presenter. In the interaction between Eve and the serpent, the serpent presented information with the intention that she would be convinced, wrongly so, to violate not only God's design for her to not eat of the fruit, but also to violate her God-designed relationship to her husband. Satan's presentation was successful. The woman was deceived into believing that she should eat, and she did exactly that. And I think, let's see. With regard to the man, and I think this is, we got 20 more slides were there to this. Oh, it's 26 slides, more than I actually remembered. But when the man ate, apparently the man needed no help from Satan to convince him to violate the criteria God had imposed upon his existence. He, the male Adam, under God, was the supreme authority over the creation and its inhabitants, including the female Adam, the woman, his subordinate was uh, being deceived, had usurped a measure of that authority and stepped outside the design of God. Whatever his reasoning, he, the man, would not be deceived, and boy, aren't we the same this day. He would act upon his own volition, his own will. He would utilize his superior authority, not following the woman's example or her expression of her will for him to transgress God's design as she had, but like her, he would usurp authority God had not delegated to him. Like Satan before him, the man would desire to be like the Most High, Isaiah. That is, he would desire to be in a position where he could choose to do God's expressed will, or he could choose to do his own will. But either way, the choice was his. He would decide good and evil for himself, and he did exactly that but not with the result he expected. And their eyes were open, and you think about it. Nothing had changed. Nothing had changed. They still lived in the same surroundings, the same weather, the same clothing or lack of clothing. And we'd say, well, God had not yet judged. Hmm. But, but had nothing changed? Nothing had changed. But something had changed. It had changed on the inside. And this changed immediately when the male Adam violated. Nothing on the outside had changed except their perception, the perspective from which they viewed everything. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking, literally making himself walk. It is a hit pile of the verb halak. So he's making himself walk, so to speak, or go in the garden, in the cool, the breeze of the day, the ruach of the day. 
And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees. So you had the sound of the Lord God going in the garden, and they hid their face. Consider, they recognized that violation of God's expression, that is violation of God's expression of his design, was violation of his person. Adam and Eve knew that God's expression of his design was a perfect representation of his person. And thus to violate the expression was to violate the person. And we still haven't learned that in this day and age. So when God calls to them and he asks where they were, Adam says, uh, by the way, there's a, who sang that song? Mm -hmm. There's a song somebody sang, Adam, where are you? And uh, and I know you'd say, you like that song? Oh. Um, uh, Don Francisco? Yes, Don Francisco. So, uh, so when, uh, the, and it, it's kind of a neat song, really. And you'd say, Brother Sheet, you ought to be more perceptive of your music than that. Well, um, if you have that opinion, keep it to yourself. Okay. So. But when he says, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid, something that had never existed before, a fear of the transcendent creator. But after Adam's violation, that fear, afraidness, an afraidness that came from violating the fear of God. So they called, that man has called, that afraidness that dread of being in the presence of God, if you will, by the very name of what they violated. They violated his fear, the criteria of his design, and the emotion that they experienced as a result, which they called by the same name, a fear of God. But a fear of God is not to be what there is in our lives as believers. So, I was afraid because I was naked. We talked about that nakedness, the exposure and everything. And I hid myself. And God asked the question, who told you that? Hmm. Isn't it interesting that the, the result of the violation brought that to the mind of the man that he knew he was naked. He did not need to be told. So, this does not work the way I want it. I want to close that. Also, it doesn't say, but I'm not sure I'm ready for it to do it. But that's okay. Done. All right, let's go over to another place mm -hmm. here. Uh, we would be. Let's look at. I want to let's at first we'll look at this. This is the Genesis 3 1 through 24. <clears throat> and we've already seen this where they made themselves aprons and uh and the different things that happened in those first verses. But uh, let's see, I think I have more of the text down here. And we talked about through verse 11. And that would take us to, to verse 12, where the man said, the woman whom thou gavest, and we've already been through these different things, the, the passing of the buck, so to speak, the man, the head, consider this, the head of, of the creation, the primary representative of God to the creation, does not accept accountability for what he had done, but he 
he passes that responsibility to the woman whom thou gavest to be with me. She gave me of the tree. So the woman, it's, it's not his fault. It's not the man's fault, according to the man. And uh, uh, probably the case in virtually all of us in every relationship we have, we're never wrong. Um, it's always somebody else. But uh, the woman and even brings in God into that equation, whom thou gavest to be with me. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So her, her expression of her will for him to eat was what motivated him to eat. Now consider this. Consider what happened. She expressed her will for what he was to do. That was her tishuka, as we talked about that word. That was her will, her design for what he should do. He was supposed to rule over her will in that respect. Now you say, well, what if she was willing for him to do something good? Then he would overrule, but he would see the value and the accuracy and the properness of what she was recommending, and then he would do it. But he was supposed to see that what she was seeking of him, what she was desiring of him to do, in this case, was not within the criteria of God's design. And he should have overruled and contradicted her will and said, no, we are not going to do that. But he did not do it. So the choice he chose to eat. And then the Lord, as though, well, okay, you're going to pass it to the woman. Well, what is this that thou hast done? Was she, was she culpable in this matter? Absolutely. She was just as guilty as anyone else. And so the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So the Lord speaks to the serpent and he pronounces a judgment. He doesn't say, why do you do this? God knew the serpent, that old, that old serpent, Satan, the devil. God knew him. And he says, because thou hast done this, thou art, a, thou art cursed above all the other cattle and the beast of the field. And you will go on your belly. And it's interesting. And dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. And it is an interesting thing. Uh, I've, I've got to tell you, uh, and I'm, I'm going to say this in a, in a kind of a judgmental fashion. I don't mean it to be that way, but it's more of an observational judgment. And, you know, when God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, most women have no affinity for serpents. Most women do not have an affinity for serpents. They can see them. They can look at them. They can appreciate their beauty, their power, their et cetera, their goodness and taking care of vermin around a place or something like that. But they don't like snakes. They don't like serpents. And it doesn't matter if it's a serpent that's a snake or if it's a serpent that's a lizard or something. Typically, that's the case. But you, when you find a woman who is, shall we say, enraptured with serpents, very often you will find a woman who is who is totally contrary and uh, to the design of God and everything else in her life. That is, she's doing it not as a demonstration of the goodness and righteousness of God's design, but she is doing it as a demonstration that she does not have to subordinate herself to the design of God. She's going to do it in total contradiction to God. And, and so you see that. So that enmity between the serpent and the woman, that's something that was built in and it came into existence at that time. It had not existed prior to the violation. Then the idea between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. And this is obviously some kind of, a, of an expression of the future where the serpent and his actions are going to be in some way bringing damage to a, a seed of the woman, but that seed of the woman is going to is going to bruise his head, though the 
the heel of that seed will be bruised itself. So obviously talking about the time of Satan trying to cause the Lord Jesus Christ to fail, but that was not going to happen. All the serpent could do <clears throat> was seemingly bruise his heel, but, but the serpent's power was crushed by the power of the Son of God in fulfilling the perfect design of God. And then unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. And that's a, a typical thing. We know the labor that women go through in bringing forth children almost entirely in every situation. And, and then we saw that desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. And then unto the Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto thy, the voice of thy wife, do you know, notice this is the foundation because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife. That was the first step of violation. When Adam chose, he chose between hearkening to the voice of God that he already had, already knew, already possessed an understanding of the design of God and in contradiction to God's design, he hearkened to the voice of his wife. He was the head. He was not supposed to submit himself to the voice of his wife if the voice of his wife was not in full and perfect accord with the design of the Creator. But Adam did it nonetheless. And he ate of the tree. And God says, now because of that, cursed is the ground for your sake. That means something has happened to the ground and it's not going to bring forth to you as it, as it has been designed to do and as you've experienced in the garden in these days. So thorns and thistles, it's going to bring, you're going to eat the herb of the field and you're going to get that herb in the sweat of your face until you return to the ground and it's interesting that he says for out of it thou was taken for dust thou art that is afar basic particles of matter and unto dust unto basic particles of matter shalt thou return is this a judgment upon man? It is a judgment in a sense, but in that sense, the judgment has already occurred because God had already built into the creation what would happen when the human violated. The human did not have to violate it, but violate in any way, his design, that is. But the human the human possessed the ability to say, yes, I will violate, or no, I will not violate. He possessed the ability to say, I will walk within the design of God, or I will walk beyond the boundaries of the design of God. And when the man chose to do that, when he chose to do that violation of the design of God, then that was all it took to to bring into power all of these things that were already there in the creation. It did not await God coming to pronounce a judgment. The judgment had already occurred. And it was a judgment that still to this day remains established in such a way that it's designed to turn men back from the wrong way and back to the way that is the only way of blessing. The design of God, and we can we can still violate and go on. Now, I wanted to point out a couple of things in uh, twenty through twenty four, and I think we have that in another document over here. Uh, but before we go there, let's go to this one here. Okay, there's a there's an interesting thing here that uh, what God clothed them with, and let's see, this is in 
Is this in 21? Yes. So in 321, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And um, just a couple of things to, to call to your attention in this. Uh, when you notice, unto the Adam, the Lord God did make coats of skins. It's interesting. Uh, this word, this is the word here that is a word for, for coats of skin. And the word is kothnoth. Kothnoth. And you say, well, so what? What does that mean? Well, that's good. Thought you'd never ask. So it, and that's the word translated literally a garment, kothnoth, garments of or, that is skin. And then we have down here, here's, here's the word in the Septuagint, ketonas. And you can see dermatinus, that, that's a word for skin, derma. You can see derma in that, dermatinus. But ketonas, keton. And here, kothnoth, kothnoth. You can see a, a K and a T and an N. And down here, you can see, not, it's not exactly K, but in the Greek, it's a key, which is like a K. A T is the next consonant, and then an N, which is the next consonant. And so let's go down. And we have uh, the Septuagint's literal translation, garments. Uh, you could look at the translation of um, this Targum of Ankylos. And um, oh, let's see, do we need... Um, he made them <clears throat> garments, and here's here's a word for garments, if you will, a little different word, but it's still, so, luvushim, luvushim, I'm sorry, luvushim, I should say, a noon on the end, that's Aramaic, and then you got the translation down here. <clears throat> Interesting that they added in the translation vestments, so, or garments of honor or value. Yakar is the word here, a word we've seen in our Esther text a couple of times. So, uh, but vestments of honor. But the point that I wanted you to catch here just briefly is when you look at this, this is, let's see if I can, yes. oh, I don't have a pen in here. Oh, just a second on my, on my other. I only have two pins to write on the computer. But I took one of them with me to church this morning. So now I need to get that one out to so get off of this computer. The other one is on my other computer in the living room. So some people have more computers than they know what to do with. But... I'm going to change the, uh, I'm going to change this. Let's see here. Yes, we're writing. Okay. And I'm going to say, say we've got, uh, I'm, on, I'm doing it backwards. And those are the three consonants of koth noth. The, this is an ending here. So we got, literally ktn this would be a k okay so ktn uh you said well that's a c well it's not really a c it's a calf but then when you go down and you had um uh a key which is like a a ch like the ch in christ but it's pronounced again like a k and they were Ketoneth, and you got the, that same KTN. Now let's just let's just do something here. Realizing that a, a first C in a word can be hard, like a instead of it being a S sound, it could be a K sound when it is followed by certain vowels. And so if we took this and this the vowel that is on this right here is an O class vowel. And then 
we would have to the way we do it because that's a short vowel we would double that t in there and you can see where the word cotton comes from the word cotton and people say well cotton the word cotton came out of egyptian no the word cotton did not come out of egyptian uh, if you consider this is this is genesis 321 if this was written by adam it would have been it would have been written sometime around ballpark 4000 bc so the word did not come from the egyptians the egyptians would have gotten it from the hebrews but it did not come from the egyptians to the hebrews now that's another one missing and let me look up here there may be something in this explanation uh, it's interesting do what it's interesting the online etymological dictionary is willing to trace cotton all the way back to the arabic but does not go any further they trace it back to arabic mm -hmm. they trace it back to arabic with a possibility of tracing it into egyptian but basically they don't go any further back than the arabic <laughs> these guys are good they're really good they said well we don't know beyond that well it's because you're blind and and deaf and dumb to truth um okay we don't need to go through this this is not this is not a completed document so we're not going to go through that but i wanted to show you that about the word cotton as as we would say where did we get such a word all right let's go over to now uh, <clears throat> here so now in verse 20 here we have adam called his wife's name eve and we say eve uh, because she was the mother of all living unto adam also and to his wife did the lord god make coats of skins and clothed them and the lord god said notice the lord god that yihye god yihye god said behold the man has become as one of us to know good and evil ah very very similar man is going to know good and evil the way we know good and evil so does he have the authority to do so no but he has come into a condition where he can he can perceive what is good and what is evil but it's all according to his mentality his finite limited human mentality so it's not by the mentality of the infinite transcendent creator and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever therefore the lord god sent him forth from the garden of eden to till the ground from whence he was taken so he drove out the man and placed at the east of the garden of eden kuruvim cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life and then we have so this is a descriptive literal translation of that then the adam called the name of his woman and he called her name Chawa. Chawa. the verb Chawa is the verb to live and so he calls her Chawa because she existed the mother of the entirety of living there would not be a human who did not come through Chawa. And by the way, this begins to tell us there's something wrong with these ideas people have about Cain being a child of, of Satan and then Abel being the child of Adam. There, these people make up all kinds of stupid things and it's really sad what they do and because everybody else believes it. So, so then, Yahweh or Yehye God made for Adam and his woman tunics of skin. Then he clothed them. Then Yehye God said, Behold, the Adam exist as one from us exist to know good and wrong or good and evil. And now facing, that's this idea, facing that he will send out his hand and he will take also from the tree of life. Now he's already, he's already in violation and they're saying, 
And now he'll stretch out his hand and he's going to take from the tree of life and he'll live in this state of violation. He will, he will eat of the fruit and he will live to indefinite time. See, looking into the future, there's no point in time. It's kind of like what Rebecca was showing you about that preposition ad on Abiyad. And the ad, he is father until. Oh, until, until when? Well, he's until. When you get there, guess what? It's still until. And you get there, it's still until, until. Because there's no defined point in time that limits the until. And the, that's the whole idea. He's going to live to Olam, indefinite time. There's no specified end of that time, if you will. And then Yihya, God, sent him out from the Garden of Eden to serve the ground from which he was taken. Then he drove out the Adam. Interesting that he drove them out. Then he caused them to dwell from east to the Garden of Eden. And the Kuruvim, Kuruvim, these are the we say cherubs, these would be the cherubs, the kuravim, and the, the flame of the twisting sword. So that it's there to keep the way of the tree of life. And I can't, uh, I could probably never accurately represent it, but I get, I kind of get this picture and we'll, we can talk about it a little more next week, but I kind of get this little picture. And that when you, you picture that that back somewhere somewhere back here and this is supposed to be three dimensional and we're going to say this is this is the tree of life and it's in the garden so then but there is a there is a way coming out there's a way coming out to the to the to the edge of the garden and this is this is the way, this is the way to, but, and this, I can't, I don't even know how I'd ever do this, but anyway, um, okay, how do you draw an angel? I do not know how to draw angels, so, so just bear with me, and uh, this is an, this is an angel, and he has wings, an angel has wings, I know, it looks more like a firefly or something like that, don't, don't worry about where's that. the halo uh oh there <laughs> yeah there's his halo on his head so uh but uh you you can see i'm obviously it's a good thing i was not an artist because i would have starved so so if you will and these are this is a sheets representation of an angel and if you think about it and the kudavim and the flame of the twisting sword and you begin to get the picture that these these angels may have had some kind of a some kind of a flaming sword in their hand, something like that. And I don't know exactly, but that idea that there's some kind of a, a flaming sword in, in the hand of each one. But whatever however it was, it was designed to keep them from access to going back in they would not be able to go back into the they would not be able to go back into the garden so this way into the garden they would not be allowed this is not going to happen and they're going to be kept out but you can consider this and this is the way i kind of picture it that Outside that garden, outside where there was no, so then you picture, here would be Adam, and here would be, uh, let's see, I would draw, this is Eve, we'll put, we'll put hair on Eve to show a man and a woman, and they could be outside. And it, it could very well be that they could actually see all the way down the path to that tree of life. And from the outside at this point, a boundary beyond which they could not ever go. They could not ever go. In here, 
in here in the garden they had spoken they were able to talk and communicate with the transcendent creator of everything they're able to have a totally unalienated relationship with the creator but now they have been driven out of the garden because the creator says we cannot give them access to the tree of life because they are now in a we will say a fallen condition they're in a state of having experienced violation and all that that involves and they must exercise their choice to be reconciled to god and that means they must exercise their choice to accept the way that god has established for reconciliation but when they do that that reconciliation occurs but until then they're outside the garden and so you think about it you know later we find this idea that men began to call in the name of and this is what they called in they began to call in the name of yeah 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 and you kind of get the picture and i know this is imagination of sheets to some extent but i'm not the first one who's ever seen it this way i can tell you but they can you imagine standing just outside and desiring to have that fellowship that you once had that totally unalienated relationship that you once had with the transcendent creator and you must stand outside the garden you can now never go into his garden again but you stand there and you say yeah yeah and they call upon the name of the lord from there and isn't it funny isn't it funny that this was basically the design for the top of the ark of the covenant. You say, well, there was no path there. There was something here. This was called the mercy seat, the place of perfect communion with the creator and so when the priest would go in he would sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat that was the place where he would meet with god kind of an interesting thing could it be that the way the ark was designed and constructed was to reflect what humans had lost when they were forced out of the garden by the creator so that they would not eat of the tree of life and live forever in an, um, in an alienated state with their creator. In other words, he pushed them out of the garden in absolute perfect love, perfect love to keep them from living forever in a in a state of having violated but had but pushed them out so that they would see the need of being reconciled and turning back to him and coming to that that mercy seat the place of what what did uh what they call it the helos terion And by the way, the H on Helosterion should be better in a superscript. Helosterion. Helosmos. The word Helosmos is the word for a satisfaction. And 
and this this was the place of the satisfaction between the two cherubs. You say, now, are you sure about all that? I'm probably more sure of it than I ought to be, but be that as it may, I am willing to be corrected by God, but not by many men. I don't know many men that know God very accurately. So, anyway, we need to stop here. Anybody have any thoughts, questions?